And one of the things I've, I've learned in uh, my journey of person-centeredness is that if we asked you what person-centeredness meant to you, you'd all give us a slightly different definition. And if we are really looking at moving our system forward, we really need to have some common understanding about what this all means. And that we're all speaking the same language and meaning the same things when we're speaking that language. So I think NCAPS and ACL have done a very nice job looking at key concepts that we really need to think about and put into practice, starting with person-centered thinking. We really wanna think about how do we reframe and reshape the way we view things so that we're looking at it through a person-centered lens as opposed to a system-centered lens? And as we do that, it starts to make a shift to how we support people in a way that it makes better sense for them than maybe it has in the past. So how do we have people at the, per, uh, at the center of things? How do we really include people and really listen to people about what it is that they want in their lives. And then how do we build that into our planning structure? The person-centered planning piece of, of the CMS final rule has been around since 2014. We're in 2022 right now, and we're still struggling with what does that really look like for folks? So we really need to think about what we can do and then put it into practice. And that's where things really start to think about how do we align and, and move things together in a way that makes sense, which means it's about the person, it's about the organization, it's about the system all going in the same direction and that we have a, a nice balance between all of that. I think what's happened over the years is we started in that middle piece to really think about the person-centered planning. And how many of us, when we started planning, we realized, oh, things aren't working out the way we thought they would. And we, we, we kind of call it, it's like the whack-a-mole game. You know, we start with planning, we think we're doing well, but then another mole pops up, so we whack that, another mole pops up. So as we go through our time in this journey, we'll talk about all of those moles that are popping up, except we're not gonna call them moles. <clears throat> as we think about this, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael to kind of give us a little reflection about where we've been with that planning piece. And as you can see from this graph, Carl Rogers coined the term patient-centered therapy. But then what we saw was a whole set of developments, primarily in the 80s, where Wolf Wolfensberger introduces principle of normalization, but recognizes that talking about his normalization is not as powerful as talking about it as people having valued roles. And Jack Yates developed the first person-centered planning process, but then Beth Mountain, John O'Brien, and Marsha Forrest developed the ones that were the most powerful in the in the 80s. And it makes you wonder if if that was true, why don't we all have good person-centered plans now? And the development never stopped. Together with Susie Harrison, I developed something called essential lifestyle planning. Bill Thomas starts the Eden Alternative. Pennsylvania looks at how to do this in the state. Michigan requires person-centered planning process. And one of the challenges that we see is everybody is requiring a person-centered planning process, including Medicare, Medicaid with the HCBS final rule. And 2014 was when that rule was published, but person-centered planning was actually required before that. But if you look at, at the challenge in all of this, next slide. Well, if you look first at development and then we'll look at the challenge. Mary Lou, you were gonna take us through how it became federal a federal rule. Yes, and um, we're not gonna take a lot of time on this today, but you know, from the graphic, what you see here is um, there's been an interesting um, series of activities coming from the federal government, whether it's within the program offices of ACL and CMS Administration for Community Living, I'm sorry in the Center for Medicaid Services, or whether it's through the Supreme Court and actually um, the Department of Justice, that the activities, some of them are very much linked to compliance with regulation and rules, such as the ADA, um, or the regulations that Michael mentioned, the person center planning regulations for home and community-based services that were um, put into effect and required as of 2014? Um, or are there other, some of the other activities that you see 
are more around moving beyond compliance, which is certainly the title of our learning collaborative with you. And that's moving beyond just meeting those minimum standards in the 2014 regulations or in the ADA, moving beyond that to compel people to say, but how can we do this really well? How can we do better than just good enough? And so when you look at some things like the person-centered options counseling series that came out through the No Wrong Door programs, or when you look at the recommendations for best practices for workforce development that CMS put out. So you'll see in that whole series of activities at the federal level that both support minimum standards at the compliance level, but then also encourage our state systems, particularly and individual organizations to move beyond minimum standards and to, to kind of go further than that. Meeting compliance and making sure, you know, the kind of the checklist approach and then the going above and beyond to make sure we have spread and that, and that this um, is, goes further than just the minimums. And you'll hear a little bit more about that from everybody in the next couple of minutes. So if you look at this slide, here's one of the challenges. The planning processes that were developed in the 80s were really targeted to be done one person at a time. The expectation is that there would be a skilled facilitator and a small group of personally committed people, what they termed a circle, which is different from a team. And those people would not only be committed to de helping develop the, the plan, but also engaged in supporting implementation and changes in the plan. But it was really designed to be done outside of the system beside the system, but outside of the system. And yet everybody agreed that people should have person-centered plans. So starting in the 1990s, you had people saying this should be a state requirement. And some states went ahead and did it. But then that whole issue of how do you take this very individualized one person at a time process to scale? And first, what we look at is that means that they're expected practice, and that's true now. But what we haven't looked at is how many changes in the system need to be in place in order for the planning effort to be aligned with implementation. So in some places you see better planning than implementation. And in few places do you see the alignment necessary to be successful. And we're gonna talk over and over again that the key to this change is you. It requires sustained support from leaders. And it takes time. Any of the good planning processes take time. But people forget that the one, the plan that takes the most time is the first plan. And if every time you do a plan, you're spending the same amount of time that you did for the first plan, you haven't aligned your efforts. And plans should evolve based on the learning from implementation. So there should be a continuous learning process, not a once a year effort to start over. And what we're looking at is how do we move from a system which really would know best? And when the system knows best, it's engaged in power over. The system of benign paternalism is still oppression. So are you really looking at what matters to the person, not what matters to the professional? Or do you have a system that assumes and acts on that assumption that everyone has value? Everyone should be listened to. Everyone can tell us regardless of disability issue, everyone can tell us what their preferences are and people, how people want to live now and how people want to live in the future provides the context and that the person is the expert. Do we have a system that operates on those assumptions or do we have a system that still says professionals know best? So when the regulations talk about preferences, what they're talking about is what's important to the person. And so part of what we find ourselves doing is learning how people want to live their lives. We call that what's important to them. Um, it may include things like relationships and purpose and meaning and status and control, culture and identity, rituals and routines, rhythm or pace of life, things to do, places to go, things to have. But it's not simply things that the person enjoys. Um, we have to have a deeper understanding of that. So I like to say that it's the stuff that sits at the core of the person on their heart. And we have to ask what's required for a person to be satisfied, comforted, 
uh, content, fulfilled, uniquely who they are and happy. Um, the regulation says that we need to address preferences, cultural considerations, and other things that are core to the person. So what is important to the person um, may also help us understand a little bit about what they value, what their principles are, and the things that tend to guide how they make their decisions on a daily basis. So what helps them be satisfied? What helps them be content? The other side of that is learning what's important for that, because within the context of important too, we have to learn about what's important for a person. Um, and for those of you who've had person-centered thinking training, you know that this balance between important to and important for is the core concept. Um, but for important for, that term is actually in our federal regulation. So there are typically requirements that are imposed by internal, um, sorry, external forces. Uh, so other people, societal expectations, things like paying our bills, following the law, and they may not matter at all to the person, but most people agree to follow those. It also includes issues of health and safety, and that's the stuff that most people who are providing services and support always, already pay great attention to. So they're linked to one another, important to and important for. And when there are changes in the things that are important for us, that can have an impact on what's important to us. And the balance can and does shift frequently. So for all of us, we're constantly nego negotiating what that balance is. Someone in our organization recently had a stroke and some of the everyday tasks that had been done without any thought at all then became difficult and then became very important to be able to do independently. So some things that we take for granted, like tying our shoes or putting on socks are now something that take more time and they take more thought. Um, it also illustrates that none of us does anything that's important to us unless there's an aspect of it that's important for us. So we call that the hook between what's important to and what's important for. It's a balance that is ever shifting. It can change easily. And if you think about just what we've all experienced in the last couple of years, we've had a shifting balance. Everyone in the world had a shifting balance as an experience because of COVID. So important to and important for are very deeply connected to one another. And it becomes our job then to look for, listen for the hook so that the person can have a balance between them, but the balance is from their perspective. So the federal reg regulations require also that we talk about risk um, and risk can be discussed and managed in person-centered service planning meetings. Um, in fact, it's expected to be and that it has to be balanced. Um, and this is about people having choice and control, um, but choice and control always has boundaries. If someone who lives in a city wants to cross the streets without support, but they don't pay attention to onco oncoming traffic, they still need to have support. So helping that person become more independent um, may well become an objective, but until they're safe, they need to have support. On the other hand, we don't want people who are bubble wrapped against all harm. Um, they're alive, they're perfectly safe, but they're also miserable. That's unacceptable in the way we provide services and supports. So crossing the street without any thought about consequences may provide some freedom and independence, but the results of crossing the street without support, if you're not watching for oncoming traffic may be unpleasant. In fact, they could be dire. So we have to make sure that we're paying attention to those things and negotiating that balance all the time as we plan with people for the supports and services that they need. Um, and there are people for, for whom their behavior presents a risk to others, and we have an obligation to mitigate that risk as well. So we're always negotiating what that balance is. We really need to think about this from the level of the system and how does the system play into this? And, and are we taking efforts that make us risk averse. So that person who may not be the safest street crosser, we never let them cross the street again. You know, back in my days of providing services, I had a, a gentleman, Andy, who had this very problem. He would run across the street and not really pay attention to things. Never was hit by a car. He knew what was going on. And so the system made us have him go through a street safety class which he did, and he got monitored doing that. But as soon as the monitor left, guess what he did? You know, and he still hasn't been hit by a car. So we really need to think about how do we as a system support people in a way that makes sense. So we really need to think about how we evolve our services and supports. And what we really need to think about is how we can do this from 
change efforts. And we look at three levels of change that we're going to explore as we go through our time together. And as leaders, where do you fit in making these changes happen? So when we think about a level one change, a level one change is something that's very powerful and doesn't require anybody's permission. It's something that any one of us could do and have a positive impact on a person's life or in a situation that's going on. So we really want to think about where are those opportunities? I think they're pretty rich but we may not be used to seeing them, or we may see them and think we're gonna get in trouble if we do something that others may think is not okay to do. So we really need to think about from a leader perspective, how do you help those that you supervise and those that you work with to know what the boundaries are? Where do you have those opportunities to make changes? Because it's not going to have um, an impact on the organization, but it is going to have a positive impact on people supported. That could be with coworkers, that could be with people using our services and supports. When we really need leaders involved is when those level one changes are bumping up against, we really do need permission to make a change. And as leaders, what can you do to say, okay, well, let's look at this. And how do we shift things around so that we provide more ability for people to have autonomy and control of their lives? And when we do that, it creates more level one change opportunities for people to keep that cycle going. And when we think about a level two or, uh, change, it is something that impacts the entire organization and is something that does require permission. And then finally, we really need to think about the system. Where do we need to look at changes to the system? Changes such as rules and regulations, changes such as how we interpret rules and regulations. Uh, you know, as I said, I thought out of the box, I still think outside the box. One of the things I often find with systems and rules and regulations, rules and regulations really are written in shades of gray because we know we can't look at every single thing that's going to happen. So how do we have some flexibility in that? But then we have interpreters of rules and regulations. So all of a sudden those shades of gray become black and white. So how do we really look at what is the intent of the rule versus what does the actual rule say? And how do we look at the intent to really make sure that we can have those shades of gray? And from a system standpoint, you know, if the rule doesn't say we can't do it, then we probably could. But many people think the rule doesn't say we can do it, so we can't. So how do we find that balance to really make things work? And how do we as a system really look at that and support that creativity to really support people in a way that makes sense? Circles of influence and circles of control, taken from Stephen Covey, to really think about where do we have those opportunities to make those level one changes? Where do I have some control about things? Where do I have some influence if I have to approach and talk with a leader to really help some of that change happen and that shift happen in how we approach things? So we have some circle of influence. And then what is the circle of concern we have? What are the barriers that continue to get in the way? And how do we then start to tackle this? So when we think about what are our concerns, some of the things that may come to mind, or what are the specific regulations, practices, procedures, policies that we operate under? So many times we hear, well, the rule won't let me do that. But if we really looked at the rule, does it say that or not? So how do we really look at the specifics? I was working with a state that when they were going through a systems change effort, the first thing they did was they looked at their rules and regs to see what was going to get in the way of being person-centered. And out of all of their volumes of rules and regs, they found two that they needed variances for. But if you talk to people in the system, we can't do anything because the rules don't let us. So we really need to shift how we view things. That's going to require changes in how we do our work. So what are some of the concerns that come up with that? And that leads to some resistance to change because sometimes people don't like to change. So how do we start to tackle that? And some of it is ourselves. We may sometimes be our own worst enemy. So what are some things that we need to do differently as we are moving forward? And then we can start to think about where do we have some influence? <clears throat> and where do we feel empowered to take a step to try something different? So we want to be mindful of, is there something that we could do that perhaps we 
have been a little reluctant to do or to try. You know, I think oftentimes we may be creative, but sometime in our past, we may have gotten in trouble for doing something outside the box. So we never want to think outside the box again. This is an opportunity to really think outside the box and people will discover how refreshing that is. So we really need to think about what we can do to make that happen. And then knowing that we can't do this on our own, who are the people that we need to be talking with and work in partnership to really think about how collectively can we, can we do this? So thinking about your circle of influence, where do you have people, where do you have their ears so that you can talk with folks and really try to make things work a little bit better? And it all starts with where do we have the power to address some of the things that are getting in the way? Do we have the ability to make that change all on our own? How many times do we have new employees come into our organization and they see things with fresh eyes? Oh, why do you do it that way? Well, you know, that's just the way we do it here. So people may be a little reluctant to try new things. This is an opportunity to think about how do I give permission and create an atmosphere where it's okay to try things and also knowing where is it not okay to try things? How do we as leaders create those parameters to support people in making that happen? Those are some things that we will be exploring as we move forward in our journey. I'm going to turn it back to Michael. We are saying that there's nine elements that you need to keep in mind if you're leading change. And that part of the problem has been is that people have focused on one or two elements rather than the nine. We began with thinking about pillars. And then as we started looking at elements, we started talking about elephants. And then we thought about the analogy of where the people with visual impairments were asked to describe an elephant by feeling it. And each one came up with a different description of what the elephant was. And that has been the history of change in our system. People just function, just look at one element or another, not a whole group of elements needing to work together in order to have a system that works. So if you look at what those nine elements are, it begins and ends with leaders. Sustained engagement from leaders is the biggest predictor of success in all of our work. Rosabeth Moss Cantor said that at the beginning of a change process, it's exciting. At the end, it's very satisfying. And during the middle, it's a slog. It's just putting one foot in front of the other. And that's where a lot of the change efforts die. They're too focused on a single element and they're not looked at, they're not looking at the length of time, several years that is really required for change. We very briefly look at each one of these vision, mission and values. You know, the Cheshire Cat famously said, if you don't know where you're going, any direction, any road will do. Well, vision creates direction by describing the destination. Vision and mission is the why of the work. And values describe the key behavioral elements of the desired organizational culture. And advocacy, we often talk about the importance of external advocates, but we also need to remember that it's internal advocates that keep us on track. They're the champions who are seeking to have this work for, for us. So you need both external and internal advocates. Trauma is now universal. We've all been through the COVID epidemic. Some of us are still struggling with it. And for people who use services, trauma was pretty much universal already. So we talk about having a trauma-informed services, but we need a trauma-informed system. It needs to be trauma-responsive for those who provide or manage the service system. We need to do something that creates psychological safety, a series of things that really helps support positive control and reinforces positive relationships. And there are questions that we should be asking when we do planning that reflect the universality of trauma. But the planning itself is really a way to determine what outcomes people want, how do people want to live, and what are the next steps to get there. And we need people who are competent in doing that and can do it at scale. We need a system that supports doing it at scale. And it needs to be culturally responsive. We need cultural competence, but we also need cultural humility. We need to recognize that culture is one of those things where learning is continuous. And we need to have a system 
that supports the people doing the work. The same person-centered thinking skills that are helpful for people who are doing the planning are also helpful helpful for people who are doing the supporting. And the support is a chain. So if I'm gonna be supported, I'm gonna feel respected, I'm gonna work in partnership. Well, if I'm gonna be respected, that means that my manager is respectful, which means that their manager is respectful, which means that the system has an organizational culture that supports people who use the services, it supports people who develop the services and those who implement. But it's also an organizational culture that's very focused on learning and how do we engage in continuous learning, continue to learn, but none of it works if, if it's not aligned. We're gonna be talking about the importance of positive pressure for change. Change only occurs when the pressure is greater than the resistance. That means that we need pressure that's pushing in the right direction. Well, how the pieces of the system work together, where they're not working together, they create friction. And where that friction is present, you have a lack of efficiency and effectiveness where you have alignment, you get greater efficiency and effectiveness. And the system, all the pieces need to be able to work together which means that when you're looking at assessment, intake, evaluation, planning, all of the pieces of the formal system, you need to be looking at, are they helping us learn about the person? Are they helping us learn how to support the person? Are they helping us develop outcomes and act on them? And then the last in this series, before we get to leaders again, is the idea that quality management is not an afterthought, quality management is listed at this place because it needs to take into account all of the rest. Quality management needs to be looking at what's underneath what's happening, needs to be asking questions such as the five whys and looking at how you do this in a way where you're managing by data. But if you wanna lead change back to leaders, part of what we tell leaders is you lead with stories and you manage with data. And that takes you back to leadership piece. And we've uh, created these icons to go along with each of these elements so that as we go through this, those, those icons will help us know what element we are discussing. The slide that you're looking at in front of you is um, represents a, um, an additional document that you'll hear throughout all of the sessions. Um, we'll be referring to this. And on the right side of your slide, what you see there is the title page for a document called Person-Centered Practices Self-Assessment. That has the NCAPS logo on it. And then the subheading is uh, for government agencies that oversee human services. Uh, So on the left, you'll see the description that this is really for a self-assessment for human service, government human service agencies, I'm sorry who are interested in strengthening the foundation of person-centered practices by moving beyond compliance. So that's really what this uh, self-assessment that we've designed and is available to all of you through the NCAPS website. Um, That's really what it's all about. And on the next slide, you'll see that um, what we did was we kind of switched it up on you and we moved the title slide. The picture of the title slide is now on the left. Um, And uh, what this talks about is that the self-assessment tool gives you an idea of, are you where you want to be? So is your system performing in a way that is equal to um, what you expect it to be doing? And so this is a tool that's going to help a system. And so, again, when we talk about a system, we're talking about a very large set of activities and procedures, bureaus, offices, um, various kinds of requirements, all interacting together to accomplish person-centered practices. So this isn't just a small, you know, it's it's not intended or designed for a small organization, although there will certainly be some parts that will help you and we'll point that out along the way. Uh, But the self-assessment tool is really for improving or advancing your system's person-centered practices. 
And so on the next slide here, what you'll see is um, the eight major system components that are addressed in the self-assessment. And so this represents, you'll see these eight pictures, these eight um, drawings, if you will, that represent all of the sections that are covered in self-assessment. So leadership, person-centered culture, eligibility, and service access. And let me just pause there and mention too that regardless of what population you support, so you might be here because your organization supports people who um, are looking for support in, because of the changes in their life as their age advances. You may be here because you support people who have chronic or persistent long-term mental health needs. Perhaps you're supporting, I know that there is somebody that is with us today that was supporting um, teenage parents. Uh, you may also be in a system that supports people for lifelong, who need have lifelong service and support needs, or maybe it's somebody who, uh, maybe your system is that which supports people with um, recent or a sudden um, brain injury that has changed their life and has caused them to need support. So regardless of what the purpose or the need, what the need driven um, origination is for somebody coming to your system to, to get support, these eight areas tend to always exist. And so moving on from eligibility and service access, we looked at, whoops, back for one yeah. second. Yep person-centered, the planning and monitoring of services, the financing of services, uh, the workforce and supporting the workforce in their capacity as well as their capabilities. Um, and then looking at collaboration and building partnership among and between all of these different pieces and parts and all of these different agencies. And then certainly not least, but last in the list, talking about how do you assure quality and innovation. So all of these parts interact together. And now on the next slide, Bob, sorry for me delaying there. Um, the purpose is really, so the tool, what you see again on the left side is the, um, the cover of the assessment. And on the right, what you'll see are these three kind of very specific intended purpose of the tool. One is to set your baseline. Where are we? We think we know where we are. But it's set up so that you would have as many um, people in your system, in, in your state agency, typically, or your government agency. Maybe it's a tribal agency. Maybe it's um, maybe you're a territory here from one of the territories. So you would have employees of that system uh, fill it out and create a baseline of where are we functioning right now? The next part that it does is helps you actually set goals. Okay, so based on where we are, where do we need to be? What do we want to do for our next steps? And then that last piece that it does is also gives you a check-in point. You can come back after you've worked hard at this for six months or a year. You can come back to the self-assessment tool, use it again to determine, are we making progress? Have we made progress? So that was the purpose and how it was designed. Um, and then you'll see on the next couple of slides. So the next slide still showing the same self-assessment cover, the links to the nine elements that Michael just shared with us. In each element, um, you'll find it somewhere in the self-assessment, but that's our job. We're going to help you. We're not going to have you kind of guess, you know, kind of like where's Waldo? Let's go and guess where the uh, nine elements appear. We'll be sharing with you, and you'll see in the next slide, some very specific examples. Um, so, for example, vision, mission, and values. Um, in section 1.1 of the assessment, it's very clear that there's an expectation with leadership for mission, vision, and values. In section 8.1 under quality, there's a very clear expectation that your quality system is hooked and designed directly back to reflect are you enacting or are you acting on your mission and standards? Advocacy, there's very clear section in 7.4 around building trust with advocacy and self-advocacy organizations. Trauma is addressed very specifically in the person-centered approaches to risk, which appear in section 2.3. You'll see that outcomes and cultural considerations, and this is one that there are several components to this part. So, 
There's actually even a few more that as we get to that, we'll roll out and we're rolling that out with you. You'll see that not only in person-centered planning and in person-centered supports plans, but also in the way that you authorize for services. And what we'll be looking at is the, um, is there an understanding of cultural competency and real cultural understanding of identity and where it fits not only in plans, but in how your system is designed to support people from all walks of life. The last couple of sections, and you see on here in each one of these areas, what you see at the top is the icon that Bob mentioned that the nine elements, each one of the nine elements have an icon and we've linked those icons, icons pardon me, through color um, to the various sections um, of the self-assessment. So these are the various shades of purple through blue. You'll see that also as we, um, so we're trying to kind of help people have as many graphic representations that link the person-centered self system self-assessment tool with the nine elements of a person-centered system that you'll be learning during this learning collaborative. So uh, I won't read all the details again, but moving left to right, engaging supporters, talking about case management and the direct care workforce, but it also talks about how you build trust with families. And then organizational culture is the second one in, changing culture and cultural competence. Uh, there's a lot of relevance, a lot of references to organizational culture throughout the self-assessment. Specifically, quality management, there is a whole, all of section eight will really apply there in the self-assessment. And then the furthest on the right, what you see here on the slide in front of you, leadership, uh, there is an entire section on leadership's role in strategy building, for example, in communication, in changing statute, regulation, and policy. And as Bob mentioned a few minutes ago, Moving on beyond compliance with those particular section, statute, regulation, and policy also requires, for example, that we involve reviewers and licensing agents, um, people who do the certification and how they interpret regulation and policy, not just what's read, you know, kind of a checklist in the, the black and white of the rule. Underlying all of this, you'll see a key element is alignment. So that's where the blue arrow at the bottom of the slide um, shows that there needs to be alignment and some consistent threads that hold all of these together. Um, so from there, I'm going to turn it back over to Tanya. Uh, Michael said to you earlier, it starts and ends with leaders. Leaders set the tone. So if you will allow me a little joke um, to lead the herd of elephants for person-centered systems. Um, leaders are the key to change and leaders are responsible for all of the nine elements. They should also be able to see where additional attention is needing, needed and where things are going well. So we will begin with leaders and we will end with leaders as well. We really want to thank you for your time today. One of the things you'll learn about Michael, Michael does not have the word finished in his vocabulary because everything is about constant and continuous learning. And that's how we keep things moving forward. So let's think about where we are going to be and what we are going to learn as we take this journey together. So thank you for your time today.